Hello, I'm Joanne and this is Relax for a While. I create soothing videos to help you drift off to sleep. If you enjoy my videos and find them helpful, please hit the like button, subscribe, and click on the notification bell. A special thanks goes out to all my wonderful patrons. Your support means the world to me. My friend, I hope you enjoy this video. May it bring you restful sleep. Tonight I will be reading a few more chapters of The Wonderful Wizard of Oz by Al Frank Baum. I know there are many of you who have been eagerly waiting for me to read more of these chapters, and so I want to thank you for your patience as I slowly but surely get through the readings of all the chapters of this amazing story. And so, as always, my friend, settling comfortably under the covers, take a full, comfortable breath, and as you exhale, relax and let go. Allow any tension to just melt away, letting your body sink deeper and deeper down into the softness of your bed. There is nothing else to do and nowhere else to be. So just lie back, relax, and enjoy the story. Chapter 12 The Search for the Wicked Witch The soldier with the green whiskers led them through the streets of the Emerald City until they reached the room where the guardian of the gates lived. This officer unlocked their spectacles to put them back in his great box, and then he politely opened the gate for our friends. Which road leads to the Wicked Witch of the West? asked Dorothy. There is no road, answered the guardian of the gates. No one ever wishes to go that way. How then are we to find her? inquired the girl. That will be easy, replied the man, for when she knows you're in the country of the Winkies, she will find you and make you all her slaves. Perhaps not, said the scarecrow, for we mean to destroy her. Oh, that is different, said the guardian of the gates. No one has ever destroyed her before so I naturally thought she would make slaves of you, as she has of the rest. But take care, for she is wicked and fierce, and may not allow you to destroy her. Keep to the west where the sun sets, and you cannot fail to find her. They thanked him, and bade him goodbye, and turned toward the west, walking over fields of soft grass dotted here and there with daisies and buttercups, Dorothy still wore the pretty silk dress she had put on in the palace, but now, to her surprise, she found it was no longer green but pure white. The ribbon around Toto's neck had also lost its green color and was as white as Dorothy's dress. The Emerald City was soon left far behind. As they advanced, the ground became rougher and hillier, for there were no farms nor houses in the country of the West and the ground was untilled. In the afternoon, the sun shone hot in their faces, for there were no trees to offer them shade, so that before night, Dorothy and Toto and the lion were tired, and lay down upon the grass and fell asleep, with the woodman and the scarecrow keeping watch. Now the Wicked Witch of the West had but one eye, yet that was as powerful as a telescope, and could see everywhere. So as she sat in the door of her castle, she happened to look around and saw Dorothy lying asleep with her friends all about her. They were a long distance off, but the wicked witch was angry to find them in her country, so she blew upon a silver whistle that hung around her neck. At once there came running to her, from all directions, a pack of great wolves. They had long legs and fierce eyes and sharp teeth. Go to those people, said the witch, and tear them to pieces. 
Are you not going to make them your slaves? asked the leader of the wolves. No, she answered. One is of tin and one of straw. One is a girl and another a lion. None of them is fit to work, so you may tear them into small pieces. Very well, said the wolf, and he dashed away at full speed, followed by the others. It was lucky the scarecrow and the woodman were wide awake and heard the wolves coming. This is my fight, said the woodman, so get behind me and I will meet them as they come. He seized his axe, which he had made very sharp, and as the leader of the wolves came on, the tin woodman swung his arm and chopped the wolf's head from its body so that it immediately died. As soon as he could raise his axe, another wolf came and he also fell under the sharp edge of the tin woodman's weapon. There were forty wolves, and forty times a wolf was killed, so that at last they all lay dead in a heap before the woodman. Then he put down his axe and sat beside the scarecrow, who said, It was a good fight, friend. They waited until Dorothy awoke the next morning. The little girl was frightened when she saw the great pile of shaggy wolves, but the tin woodman told her all. She thanked him for saving them and sat down to breakfast, after which they started again upon their journey. Now the same morning the wicked witch came to the door of her castle and looked out with her one eye that could see far off. She saw all her wolves lying dead and the strangers still traveling through her country. This made her angrier than before, and she blew her silver whistle twice. Straight away, a great flock of wild crows came flying toward her, enough to darken the sky. And the wicked witch said to the king crow, Fly at once to the strangers, peck out their eyes, and tear them to pieces. The wild crows flew in one great flock toward Dorothy and her companions, when the little girl saw them, she was afraid. But the scarecrow said, This is my battle, so lie down beside me and you will not be harmed. So they all lay upon the ground except the scarecrow, and he stood up and stretched out his arms. And when the crows saw him, they were frightened, as these birds always are by scarecrows, and did not dare to come any nearer. But the king crow said, it is only a stuffed man. I will peck his eyes out. The king crow flew at the scarecrow, who caught it by the head and twisted its neck until it died. And then another crow flew at him, and the scarecrow twisted its neck also. There were forty crows, and forty times the scarecrow twisted a neck until at last all were lying dead beside him. Then he called to his companions to rise and again they went upon their journey. When the wicked witch looked out again and saw all her crows lying in a heap, she got into a terrible rage and blew three times upon her silver whistle. Then there was a great buzzing in the air and a swarm of black bees came flying toward her. Go to the strangers and sting them to death, commanded the witch and the bees turned and flew rapidly until they came to where Dorothy and her friends were walking. But the woodman had seen them coming, and the scarecrow had decided what to do. Take out my straw and scatter it over the little girl and the dog and the lion, he said to the woodman, and the bees cannot sting them. This the woodman did, and as Dorothy lay close beside the lion and held Toto in her arms, the straw covered them entirely. The bees came and found no one but the woodman to sting, so they flew at him and broke off all their stings against the tin without hurting the woodman at all. And as bees cannot live when their stings are broken, that was the end of the black bees, and they lay scattered thick about the woodman like little heaps of fine coal. Then Dorothy and the lion got up, and the girl helped the tin woodman put the straw back into the scarecrow again, until he was as good as ever. So they started upon their journey once more. The wicked witch was so angry when she saw her black bees in little heaps like fine coal, 
that she stamped her foot and tore her hair and gnashed her teeth. And then she called a dozen of her slaves who were the Winkies and gave them sharp spears, telling them to go to the strangers and destroy them. The Winkies were not a brave people, but they had to do as they were told. So they marched away until they came near Dorothy. Then the lion gave a great roar and sprang towards them, and the poor Winkies were so frightened that they ran back as fast as they could. When they returned to the castle, the wicked witch beat them well with a strap and sent them back to their work, after which she sat down to think what she should do next. She couldn't understand how all her plans to destroy these strangers had failed, but she was a powerful witch, as well as a wicked one, and she soon made up her mind how to act. There was in her cupboard a golden cap with a circle of diamonds and rubies running round it. This golden cap had a charm. Whoever owned it could call three times upon the winged monkeys who would obey any order they were given. But no person could command these strange creatures more than three times. Twice already the wicked witch had used the charm of the cap. Once was when she had made the Winkies her slaves and set herself to rule over the country. The winged monkeys helped her do this. The second time was when she had fought against the great Oz himself and driven him out of the land of the West. The winged monkeys had also helped her in doing this. Only once more could she use this golden cap, for which reason she did not like to do so until all her powers were exhausted. But now that her fierce wolves and her wild crows and her stinging bees were gone, and her slaves had been scared away by the cowardly lion, she saw there was only one way left to destroy Dorothy and her friends. So the wicked witch took the golden cap from her cupboard and placed it upon her head. Then she began to chant the magic spell. Now the charm began to work. The sky was darkened, and a low rumbling sound was heard in the air. There was a rushing of many wings, a great chattering and laughing, and the sun came out of the dark sky to show the wicked witch, surrounded by a crowd of monkeys, each with a pair of immense and powerful wings on his shoulders. One, much bigger than the others, seemed to be their leader. He flew close to the witch and said, You have called us for the third and last time. What do you command? Go to the strangers who are within my land, and destroy them all except the lion, said the wicked witch. Bring that beast to me, for I have a mind to harness him like a horse and make him work. Your command shall be obeyed, said the leader. Then, with a great deal of chattering and noise, the winged monkeys flew away to the place where Dorothy and her friends were walking. Some of the monkeys seized the tin woodman and carried him through the air until they were over a country thickly covered with sharp rocks. Here they dropped the poor woodman who fell a great distance to the rocks, where he lay so battered and dented that he could neither move or groan. Others of the monkeys caught the scarecrow, and with their long fingers pulled all the straw out of his clothes and head. They made his hat and boots and clothes into a small bundle and threw it into the top branches of a tall tree. The remaining monkeys threw pieces of stout rope around the lion and wound many coils about his body, head, and legs until he was unable to bite or scratch or struggle in any way. Then they lifted him up and flew away with him to the witch's castle, where he was placed in a small yard with a high fence around it so that he could not escape. But Dorothy they did not harm at all. She stood with Toto in her arms, watching the sad fate of her comrades and thinking it would soon be her turn. The leader of the winged monkeys flew up to her, his long, hairy arms stretched out and his ugly face grinning terribly. But he saw the mark of the good witch's kiss upon her forehead and stopped short motioning the others not to touch her. We dare not harm this little girl, he said to them, for she is protected by the power of good 
and that is greater than the power of evil. All we can do is to carry her to the castle of the wicked witch and leave her there. So, carefully and gently, they lifted Dorothy in their arms and carried her swiftly through the air until they came to the castle, where they set her down upon the front doorstep. Then the leader said to the witch, We have obeyed you as far as we are able. The tin woodman and the scarecrow are destroyed, and the lion is tied up in your yard. The little girl we dare not harm, nor the dog she carries in her arms. Your power over our band is now ended, and you will never see us again. Then all the winged monkeys, with much laughing and chattering and noise, flew into the air and were soon out of sight. The wicked witch was both surprised and worried when she saw the mark on Dorothy's forehead, for she knew well that neither the winged monkeys nor she herself dare hurt the girl in any way. She looked down at Dorothy's feet, and seeing the silver shoes, began to tremble with fear, for she knew what a powerful charm belonged to them. At first, the witch was tempted to run away from Dorothy. But she happened to look into the child's eyes and saw how simple the soul behind them was and that the little girl did not know of the wonderful power the silver shoes gave her. So the wicked witch laughed to herself and thought, I can still make her my slave, for she does not know how to use her power. Then she said to Dorothy, harshly and severely, Come with me and see that you mind everything I tell you. For if you do not, I will make an end of you, as I did with the tin woodman and the scarecrow. Dorothy followed her through many of the beautiful rooms in her castle, until they came to the kitchen, where the witch bade her clean the pots and kettles, and sweep the floor, and keep the fire fed with wood. Dorothy went to work meekly, with her mind made up to work as hard as she could, for she was glad the wicked witch had decided not to kill her. With Dorothy hard at work, the witch thought she could go into the courtyard and harness the cowardly lion like a horse. It would amuse her, she was sure, to make him draw her chariot whenever she wished to go to drive. But as she opened the gate, the lion gave a loud roar and bounded at her so fiercely that the witch was afraid and ran out and shut the gate again. If I cannot harness you, said the witch to the lion, speaking through the bars of the gate, I can starve you. You shall have nothing to eat until you do as I wish. So after that, she took no food to the imprisoned lion, but every day she came to the gate at noon and asked, Are you ready to be harnessed like a horse? And the lion would answer, No, if you come in this yard, I will bite you. The reason the lion did not have to do as the witch wished was that every night, while the woman was asleep, Dorothy carried him food from the cupboard. After he had eaten, he would lie down on his bed of straw, and Dorothy would lie beside him and put her head on his soft, shaggy mane, while they talked of their troubles and tried to plan some way to escape. But they could find no way to get out of the castle for it was constantly guarded by the yellow winkies, who were the slaves of the wicked witch and too afraid of her to not do as she told them. The girl had to work hard during the day, and often the witch threatened to beat her with the same old umbrella she always carried in her hand. But, in truth, she did not dare to strike Dorothy because of the mark upon her forehead. The child did not know this, and was full of fear for herself and Toto. Once, the witch struck Toto a blow with her umbrella, and the brave little dog flew at her and bite her leg in return. The witch did not bleed where she was bitten, for she was so wicked that the blood in her had dried up many years before. Dorothy's life became very sad as she grew to understand that it would be harder than ever to get back to Kansas and Aunt Em again, Sometimes she would cry bitterly for hours, with Toto sitting at her feet and looking into her face, whining dismally to show how sorry he was for his little mistress. Toto did not really care whether he was in Kansas or the Land of Oz, so long as Dorothy was with him, 
but he knew the little girl was unhappy, and that made him unhappy too. Now the wicked witch had a great longing to have her own the silver shoes which the girl always wore. Her bees and her crows and her wolves were lying in heaps and drying up, and she had used up all the power of the golden cap. But if she could only get hold of the silver shoes, they would give her more power than all the other things she had lost. She watched Dorothy carefully to see if she ever took off her shoes, thinking she might steal them. But the child was so proud of her pretty shoes that she never took them off except at night and when she took a bath. The witch was too much afraid of the dark to dare go in Dorothy's room at night to take the shoes, and her dread of water was greater than her fear of the dark, so she never came near when Dorothy was bathing. Indeed, the old witch never touched water, nor ever let water touch her in any way. But the wicked creature was very cunning and she finally thought of a trick that would give her what she wanted. She placed a bar of iron in the middle of the kitchen floor, and then by her magic arts made the iron invisible to human eyes, so that when Dorothy walked across the floor, she stumbled over the bar, not being able to see it, and fell at full length. She was not much hurt, but in her fall one of the silver shoes came off, and before she could reach it, the witch had snatched it away and put it on her own skinny foot. The wicked woman was greatly pleased with the success of her trick, for as long as she had one of the shoes, she owned half the power of their charm, and Dorothy could not use it against her, even had she known how to do so. The little girl, seeing she had lost one of her pretty shoes, grew angry and said to the witch, Give me back my shoe. I will not, retorted the witch, for it is now my shoe and not yours. You are a wicked creature, cried Dorothy. You have no right to take my shoe from me. I shall keep it just the same, said the witch, laughing at her, and some day I shall get the other one from you too. This made Dorothy so very angry that she picked up the bucket of water that stood near and dashed it over the witch, wetting her from head to foot. Instantly, the wicked woman gave a loud cry of fear, and then, as Dorothy looked at her in wonder, the witch began to shrink and fall away. See what you have done, she screamed. In a minute I shall melt away. I am very sorry, said Dorothy who was truly frightened to see the witch actually melting away like brown sugar before her very eyes. "'Didn't you know water would be the end of me?' asked the witch, in a wailing, despairing voice. "'Of course not,' answered Dorothy. "'How should I?' "'Well, in a few minutes I shall be all melted, and you will have the castle to yourself. I have been wicked in my day, but I never thought a little girl like you would ever be able to melt me and end my wicked deeds. Look out, here I go. With these words, the witch fell down in a brown, melted, shapeless mass and began to spread over the clean boards of the kitchen floor. Seeing that she had really melted away to nothing, Dorothy drew another bucket of water and threw it over the mess. She then swept it all out the door. After picking out the silver shoe, which was all that was left of the old woman, she cleaned and dried it with a cloth and put it on her foot again. Then, being at last free to do as she chose, she ran out of the courtyard to tell the lion that the wicked witch of the west had come to an end and that they were no longer prisoners in a strange land. Chapter 13 The Rescue The cowardly lion was much pleased to hear that the wicked witch had been melted by a bucket of water, and Dorothy at once unlocked the gate of his prison and set him free. They went in together to the castle, where Dorothy's first act was to call all the Winkies together and tell them they were no longer slaves. 
There was great rejoicing among the yellow winkies, for they had been made to work hard during many years for the wicked witch, who had always treated them with great cruelty. They kept this day as a holiday, then and ever after, and spent the time in feasting and dancing. If our friends, the Scarecrow and the Tin Woodman, were only with us, said the Lion, I should be quite happy. Don't you suppose we could rescue them? asked the girl anxiously. We can try, answered the Lion. So they called the Yellow Winkies and asked them if they would help to rescue their friends, and the Winkies said they would be delighted to do all in their power for Dorothy, who had set them free from bondage. So she chose a number of the Winkies who looked as if they knew the most, and they all started away. They traveled that day and part of the next until they came to the rocky plain where the tin woodman lay, all battered and bent. His axe was near him, but the blade was rusted and the handle broken off short. The Winkies lifted him tenderly in their arms and carried him back to the yellow castle again. Dorothy shedding a few tears by the way at the sad plight of her old friend, and the lion looking sober and sorry. When they reached the castle, Dorothy said to the Winkies, Are any of your people tinsmiths? Oh yes, some of us are very good tinsmiths, they told her. Then bring them to me, she said. And when the tinsmiths came, bringing with them all their tools and baskets, she inquired. Can you straighten out those dents in the tin woodman and bend him back into shape again and solder him together where he is broken? The tin smiths looked at the woodman over carefully and then answered that they thought they could mend him so he would be as good as ever. So they set to work in one of the big yellow rooms of the castle and worked for three days and four nights, hammering and twisting and bending and soldering and polishing and pounding at the legs and body and head of the Tin Woodman, until at last he was straightened out in his old form, and his joints worked as well as ever. To be sure, there were several patches on him, but the tinsmiths did a good job, and as the Woodman was not a vain man, he did not mind the patches at all. At last, he walked into Dorothy's room and thanked her for rescuing him. He was so pleased that he wept tears of joy, and Dorothy had to wipe every tear carefully from his face with her apron so his joints would not be rusted. At the same time, her own tears fell thick and fast at the joy of meeting her old friend again, and these tears did not need to be wiped away. As for the lion, he wiped his eyes so often with the tip of his tail that it became quite wet, and he was obliged to go out into the courtyard and hold it in the sun till it dried. If we only had the scarecrow with us again, said the tin woodman, when Dorothy had finished telling him everything that had happened, I should be quite happy. We must try to find him, said the girl. So she called the Winkies to help her, and they walked all that day and part of the next until they came to the tall tree in the branches of which the winged monkeys had tossed the scarecrow's clothes. It was a very tall tree, and the trunk was so smooth that no one could climb it, but the woodman said at once, I'll chop it down, and then we can get the scarecrow's clothes. Now while the tinsmiths had been at work mending the woodman himself, another of the winkies, who was a goldsmith, had made an axe handle of solid gold and fitted it to the woodman's axe instead of the old broken handle. Others polished the blade until all the rust was removed and it glistened like burnished silver. As soon as he had spoken, the tin woodman began to chop, and in a short time the tree fell over with a crash, whereupon the scarecrow's clothes fell out of the branches and rolled off on the ground. Dorothy picked them up and had the Winkies carry them back to the castle where they were stuffed with nice clean straw. And behold, here was the Scarecrow, as good as ever, thanking them over and over again for saving him. Now that they were reunited, 
Dorothy and her friends spent a few happy days at the Yellow Castle, where they found everything they needed to make them comfortable. But one day, the girl thought of Aunt Em and said, We must go back to Oz and claim his promise. Yes, said the woodman, at last I shall get my heart. And I shall get my brains, added the scarecrow joyfully. And I shall get my courage, said the lion thoughtfully. And I shall get back to Kansas, cried Dorothy, clapping her hands. Oh, let us start for the Emerald City tomorrow. This they decided to do. The next day, they called the Winkies together and bade them goodbye. The Winkies were sorry to have them go, and they had grown so fond of the Tin Woodman that they begged him to stay and rule over them in the Yellow Land of the West. Finding they were determined to go, the Winkies gave Toto and Lion each a golden collar, and to Dorothy they presented a beautiful bracelet studded with diamonds, and to the Scarecrow they gave a gold-headed walking stick to keep him from stumbling, and to the Tin Woodman they offered a silver oil can inlaid with gold and set with precious jewels. Every one of the travelers made the Winkies a pretty speech in return, and all shook hands with them until their arms ached. Dorothy went to the witch's cupboard to fill her basket with food for the journey, and there she saw the golden cap. She tried it on her own head and found that it fitted her exactly. She did not know anything about the charm of the golden cap, but she saw that it was pretty, so she made up her mind to wear it and carry her sunbonnet in the basket. Then, being prepared for the journey, they all started for the Emerald City and the Winkies gave them three cheers and many good wishes to carry with them. Chapter 14 The Winged Monkeys You will remember there was no road, not even a pathway, between the castle of the Wicked Witch and the Emerald City. When the four travelers went in search of the witch, she had seen them coming and so sent the winged monkeys to bring them to her. It was much harder to find their way back through the big fields of buttercups and yellow daisies than it was being carried. They knew, of course, they must go straight east, toward the rising sun, and they started off in the right way. But at noon, when the sun was over their heads, they did not know which was east and which was west, and that was the reason they were lost in the great fields. They kept on walking, however, and at night the moon came out and shone brightly, so they lay down among the sweet-smelling yellow flowers and slept soundly until morning, all but the scarecrow and the tin woodman. The next morning the sun was behind a cloud, but they started on as if they were quite sure which way they were going. If we walk far enough, said Dorothy, I am sure we shall sometime come to some place. But day by day passed away, and they still saw nothing before them but the scarlet fields. The scarecrow began to grumble a bit. We have surely lost our way, he said, and unless we find it again in time to reach the Emerald City, I shall never get my brains. Nor I my heart, declared the Tin Woodman. It seems to me I can scarcely wait till I get to Oz and you must admit this is a very long journey. I haven't the courage to keep tramping forever without getting anywhere at all, said the cowardly lion with a whimper. Then Dorothy lost heart. She sat down on the grass and looked at her companions, and they sat down and looked at her, and Toto found that for the first time in his life he was too tired to chase a butterfly that flew past his head. So he put out his tongue and panted, and looked at Dorothy as if to ask what they should do next. Suppose we call the field mice, she suggested. They could probably tell us the way to Emerald City. To be sure they could, cried the scarecrow. Why didn't we think of that before? Dorothy blew the little whistle she had always carried about her neck since the queen of the mice had given it to her. In a few minutes, they heard the pattering of tiny feet 
and many of the small gray mice came running up to her. Among them was the queen herself, who asked in her squeaky little voice, What can I do for my friends? We have lost our way, said Dorothy. Can you tell us where the Emerald City is? Certainly, answered the queen, but it is a great way off, for you have had it at your backs all this time. Then she noticed Dorothy's golden cap and said, Why don't you use the charm of the cap and call the winged monkeys to you? They will carry you to the city of Oz in less than an hour. I didn't know there was a charm, answered Dorothy in surprise. What is it? It is written inside the golden cap, replied the queen of the mice. But if you're going to call the winged monkeys, we must run away, for they are full of mischief and think it great fun to plague us. Won't they hurt me? asked the girl anxiously. Oh no, they must obey the wearer of the cap. Goodbye, and she scampered out of sight with all the mice hurrying after her. Dorothy looked inside the golden cap and saw some words written upon the lining. These, she thought, must be the charm. So she read the directions carefully and put the cap upon her head and began to read the charm. When Dorothy ended the saying of the charm, they heard a great chattering and flapping of wings as the band of winged monkeys flew up to them. The king bowed low before Dorothy and asked, What is your command? We wish to go to the Emerald City, said the child, and we have lost our way. We will carry you, replied the king, and no sooner had he spoken than two of the monkeys caught Dorothy in their arms and flew away with her. Others took the scarecrow and the woodman and the lion, and one little monkey seized Toto and flew after them, although the dog tried hard to bite him. The scarecrow and the tin woodman were rather frightened at first, for they remembered how badly the winged monkeys had treated them before, but they saw that no harm was intended, so they rode through the air quite cheerfully and had a fine time looking at the pretty gardens and woods far below them. Dorothy found herself riding easily between two of the biggest monkeys, one of them the king himself. They had made a chair of their hands and were careful not to hurt her. Why do you have to obey the charm of the golden cap? she asked. That is a long story, answered the king with a winged laugh. But as we have a long journey before us, I will pass the time by telling you about it if you wish. I shall be glad to hear it, she replied. Once, began the leader, we were a free people, living happily in the great forest, flying from tree to tree, eating nuts and fruit, and doing just as we pleased without calling anybody master. Perhaps some of us were rather too full of mischief at times, flying down to pull the tails of the animals that had no wings, chasing birds, and throwing nuts at the people who walked in the forest but we were careless and happy and full of fun and enjoyed every minute of the day. This was many years ago, long before Oz came out of the clouds to rule over this land. There lived here then, away at the north, a beautiful princess who was also a powerful sorceress. All her magic was used to help the people and she was never known to hurt anyone who was good. Her name was Galette, and she lived in a handsome palace built from great blocks of ruby. Everyone loved her, but her greatest sorrow was that she could find no one to love in return, since all the men were much too stupid and ugly to mate with one so beautiful and wise. At last, however, she found a boy who was handsome and manly and wise beyond his years. Galet made her mind that when he grew to be a man, she would make him her husband. So she took him to her ruby palace and used all her magic powers to make him as strong and good and lovely as any woman could wish. When he grew to manhood, Quilala, as he was called, was said to be the best and wisest man in all the land, while his manly beauty was so great that Galette loved him dearly 
and hastened to make everything ready for the wedding. My grandfather was at the time the king of the winged monkeys, which lived in the forest near Galette's palace, and the old fellow loved a joke better than a good dinner. One day, just before the wedding, my grandfather was flying out with his band when he saw Quilella walking beside the river. He was dressed in a rich costume of pink silk and purple velvet, and my grandfather thought he would see what he could do. At his word, the band flew down and seized Quilella, carried him in their arms until they were over the middle of the river, and then dropped him into the water. Swim out, my fine fellow, cried my grandfather, and see if the water has spotted your clothes. Quilella was much too wise not to swim, and he was not in the least spoiled by all his good fortune. He laughed when he came to the top of the water and swam in to shore. But when Galette came running out to him, she found his silks and velvet all ruined by the river. The princess was angry, and she knew, of course, who did it. She had all the winged monkeys brought before her, and she said at first that their wings should be tied, and they should be treated as they had treated Quilella, and dropped in the river. But my grandfather pleaded hard, for he knew the monkeys would drown in the river with their wings tied, and Quilella said a kind word for them also, so Galette finally spared them, on condition that the winged monkeys should ever after do three times the bidding of the owner of the golden cap. This cap had been made for a wedding present to Quilella, and it is said to have cost the princess half her kingdom. Of course, my grandfather and all the other monkeys at once agreed to the condition, and that is how it happens, that we are three times the slaves of the owner of the golden cap, whoever he may be. And what became of them? asked Dorothy, who had been greatly interested in the story. Quilella, being the first owner of the golden cap, replied the monkey, he was the first to lay his wishes upon us. As his bride could never bear the sight of us, he called us all to him in the forest after he had married her, and ordered us always to keep where she could never again set eyes on a winged monkey, which we were glad to do, for we were all afraid of her. This was all we ever had to do until the golden cap fell into the hands of the wicked witch of the West, who made us enslave the Winkies, and afterward drive Oz himself out of the land of the West. Now the golden cap is yours, and three times you have the right to lay your wishes upon us. As the monkey king finished his story, Dorothy looked down and saw the green, shining walls of the Emerald City before them. She wondered at the rapid flight of the monkeys, but was glad the journey was over. The strange creatures set the travelers down carefully before the gate of the city. The king bowed low to Dorothy and then flew swiftly away, followed by all his band. That was a good ride, said the little girl. Yes, and a quick way out of our troubles, replied the lion. How lucky it was you brought away that wonderful cap.